Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Jens Ahrens from Technical University of Berlin, of the University of Technology in Berlin. And Jens received his master's degree of science with distinction in electrical engineering from Graz University of Technology in 2005. And since 2006, he works for the Deutsche Telekom Labs in the University of Technology in Berlin, where he defended his PhD in October last year. And today he is going to present analytical methods for sound of sound field synthesis theory and applications. Without further ado, yes, we have the floor. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, the term sound field synthesis is not uh, uh, an established term. People use many different terms. I will come back to this point later. <coughs> Uh, it is a, a method that we use for the presentation of audio, of spatial audio signals. Uh, but before I go into detail, I want to quickly uh, add uh, one comment to my uh, biography um, um, about the Deutsche Telekom Laboratories, because this is a, a, an institution which um, has a, a specific special aspect. And that is, it is a public-private a public, a partnership between the University of Technology and Deutsche Telekom. Deutsche Telekom is a, a private company and the major German telecommunications provider and used to be the mother of uh, T-Mobile USA. And um, the scientific, they have a, a department which is purely a telecom and a department which is purely academic. I am affiliated to the academic department, which is part of the University of Technology Berlin. Uh, I have a I'm attached to a professor, um, but the scientific staff is sponsored by telecom. That doesn't mean that uh, they force us, so they pay the university to pay us, basically, but it doesn't mean that they force us to work on, on telecom uh, re relevant project, but of course they encourage us. So now back to the topic. Uh, I guess you are aware that there are different approaches for the presentation of special audio signals. A possible categorization might be uh, on uh, head-related methods on uh, one side, which exclusively control the sound pressure at the eardrums of the listener. Um, typically, they employ head-related transfer functions, HRTFs, which um, represent the uh, acoustical influence of the human body on a sound wave that uh, impinges on, on uh, a person. And they typically employ headphones. And then on the other hand, uh, um, there are the room-related methods, which uh, um, uh, aim at satisfying uh, uh, a, a, a specific portion of space. There is, for example, stereophony and amisonic, which employ a low number of loudspeakers, say between two and maybe ten. And uh, there's, for example, also sound field synthesis, which employs a significant larger amount of loudspeakers. And when I say sound field synthesis, uh, I refer to the situ situation when an ensemble of elementary sound sources, for example, loudspeakers, is driven such that a sound field with specific desired physical properties evolves over an extended area. And this extended area can be either a plane or um, a volume. Um, so example systems, uh, example uh, uh, ensembles of elementary sound sources, um, uh, you can see here on the slide, this top uh, uh, p uh, image uh, shows a section of the loudspeaker system that we have installed in our laboratory. I also have a, a panoramic image. Um, it's uh, composed of 56 loudspeakers arranged on a circle of 1.5 meters in radius. So this is about the smallest that, uh, that is useful. Then uh, the other image shows the largest that is currently around. Uh, this is a lecture hall equipped with, I think, two and a half thousand loudspeakers uh, all around uh, in this uh, gray, along this gray ribbon, uh, driven with 800 something individual channels, sorry, uh, uh, driven by 16 synchronized uh, computers. So it's uh, an enormous uh, uh, effort in terms of the hardware. Now this is the point where uh, people often get skeptical. They say, okay, I have two loudspeakers at home and my sound system sounds great. Yes and no. Uh, it certainly sounds great, 
But there are certain things that you cannot do with stereophony or, or other methods that employ a low number of loudspeakers. I would like to postpone a discussion uh, of the use, uh, fullness of sound field synthesis to the end of the talk. Uh, because I want to, I prefer uh, outlining the, uh, the specific properties of sound field synthesis before, so that you can uh, better grasp the, uh, my opinion. So for the moment, uh, the only motivation I want to outline is that what you cannot do with stereophony is um, uh, assuring a, a plausible oral perspective. If you listen to a stereo system, you face the two loudspeakers and you move your head to the left and right, you hear how the sound sources move with you. So this is not plausible, especially when uh, you consider an extended, uh, a, a large receiver area like in a cinema or like. If uh, you have, um, uh, um, if you're familiar with the literature on sound field synthesis, you might certainly have stumbled over the uh, of two specific methods. One is wave field synthesis and the other is termed near field compensated higher order ambisonics. Um, I, it, it is, uh, the best thing is to just accept the terms as they are. It, uh, it would go a bit far to describe why this, especially this is called, uh, termed what it uh, is termed. It's more confusing rather than clarifying. So I will just, I refer to, uh, to this uh, method as ambisonics. Those are, can, can, can be formulated analytically. And of course, if there is an analytical, so an analytical solution, there can also be a numerical one. I will not explicitly speak about the numerical solutions. I, uh, at specific points, I will uh, uh, outline the impact of the results I present on the analytical uh, solutions. When I started working on these topics, the problem was that the methods um, listed here, they, uh, they base on very, very different formulations. And this is uh, even uh, diplomatically expressed. Actually, it, even the, the persons that the personalities that work on the different methods are it's two universes that that uh, that crash in uh, so either you have people who work exclusively on wave synthesis or on uh, ambisonics and uh, hardly anybody in this in the entire world actually works intensively on both so uh, our motivation was to find a framework that uh, that allows to to compare the two methods and this is what i'm going to present and uh, also, this unified framework that I will present I will allow for uh, s certain uh, extensions of, of the theory and uh, I will especially pay attention to the possibilities and limitations of uh, these methods. So this is then the contents. This will be the, the biggest part of the, of the presentation, the theory. I will present the, the framework and the properties and, uh, uh, in considerable detail. And after that, there will be a short illustration of what type of synthetic sound fields uh, you can use in order to uh, creatively employ sound field synthesis. So now uh, let's go to the, into the theory. A very elegant uh, um, starting point is to assume a continuous distribution of secondary sources. Typically, in theory, you would not speak of loudspeakers because uh, sometimes you assume properties that are not, uh, that cannot easily be associated to a loudspeaker with, uh, that has a spatial extent and is a, is a discrete uh, entity. So uh, in this case, you assume a continuous layer of loudspeakers of secondary sources. And then you can easily compare the situation to uh, related uh, problems for which the solutions exist. For example, scattering problems where you have an inhomogeneous uh, a boundary of a volume which represents the acoustical properties of a specific object. And this is exactly what we have here. This, the, the, the continuous distribution of secondary sources can be interpreted as, a, as an inhomogeneous boundary. So the essential equation is what we term synthesis equation. It states the following. We have, uh, in this case, uh, 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 an, an enclosing uh, distribution of secondary sources uh, termed d omega. The letter G refers to the spatial transfer function of the secondary sources. We use the letter G because it may be interpreted as a Green's function. And each uh, X refers to a point in space and X naught uh, refers to a point on the secondary source distribution. And D is the driving signal of the secondary sources. And if you integrate over this uh, distribution, which is enclosing in this case, it doesn't need to be a contour integral. It can also be a plane or whatever. Then this will yield uh, the synthesized sound field. Of course, usually you, would not, uh, you will not want to know what sound field evolves if you drive the, the secondary sources in a specific manner. You would rather want to know how to drive the loudspeakers in order that a specific uh, sound field evolves. So you want to dictate this and find out that. And this is the essence of the theory of sound field synthesis. 
the very important and very important aspect of this continuous formulation is the fact that you construct a, can construct a situation where you can show that perfect synthesis, physically perfect synthesis, is possible. Because if you meet a situation where the requirements for this perfect synthesis is, are not fulfilled, you know immediately before you um, find the solution that certain limitations arise. And I will out outline that later. So um, this is again a synthesis equation, just for reference. And you can physically interpret the secondary source distribution as uh, a single layer potential, which is often employed in, second, in uh, scattering problems. There it's such that um, uh, an, a scattering object, an object that, uh, uh, um, on which a specific field, for example a sound field, um, impinges, is replaced by a continuous layer of secondary sources, uh, by, a, by, a potential, by a single layer potential which represents the properties of these uh, the acoustical properties and, and the impact of this object onto the impinging sound field. This is a mathematically a very, very simple, uh, similar formulation. So you can learn a lot from, from the solutions that have been found there. And for integrals like the one stated here, uh, there is a theorem established by a Swedish mathematician Eric Fredholm, which says that, interpreted for this solution, it says that an exact solution exists for arbitrary sound, source-free sound fields. Um, if the, the secondary source distribution encloses the target volume and it has to be simply connected, there are some more, more um, prerequisites which have to be met, but uh, if we have a simply connected enclosing uh, secondary source distribution, we know that if it's uh, we can find a, a perfect solution. And this solution is then found via an orthogonal expansion of the involved quantities, the sound field, the driving function and the Green's function, this uh, secondary source transfer function. Although this is possible for very, uh, for many, or for arbitrary geometries, only the solution for the uh, sphere is practical, because in other cases you might just not find this the suitable orthogonal expression uh, expansion, and if you find it, um, it will be very difficult to implement it in practice. So now I want to illustrate uh, this the sphere problem. Uh, let's assume a sphere which is indicated by the gray shading, which is centered around the origin of the coordinate system. It has a radius uppercase R and it encloses the target volume. So we want to synthesize a sound field inside this sphere. Then this, uh, the synthesis equation looks like this. Uh, the integral over the uh, uh, alpha uh, refers to the azimuth, beta to the, to the co-latitude. And this expression here and here, this uh, represents integration over a sphere. So the uh, according to the Fredholm theorem, we can expand the, the involved quantities into uh, specific uh, uh, orthogonal uh, function, uh, basis functions. In this case, these are the surface spherical harmonics. Don't be puzzled if you don't know what, ex if you're not familiar with uh, spherical harmonics, it's, uh, it's, it's not necessary uh, to, to uh, know the details in the following. Just uh, uh, accept that it's, it's a complete basis uh, in, into which you can um, expand the, the involved quantities. And then you compare, uh, you perform a comparison of comp coefficients and you can easily fo solve for the driving signal. I want to uh, propose an alternative which is actually uh, exactly the same. It, it will, uh, for this example, it will just be in later, later in the talk, it will be very helpful to use this interpretation that I propose. I propose to interpret this integral as a convolution along the surface of a sphere because then a, con a convolution theorem can be established um, which relates the coefficients of the involved quantities uh, with respect to an expansion into spherical harmonics. So this is actually exactly the same. This is, uh, this is the comparison of coefficients but as I said later in the talk it will be clear why this can be beneficial. So you have some type of space spectrum uh, representation of the individual sound fields which can be easily solved for the coefficients of the driving function and provided that there is no zero here which is the case for example for omnidirectional secondary sources you can compose the driving signal from the coefficients these are the basis functions so you have to sum up over this uh, infinite amount of basis functions but you don't need to go to infinity because this thesis converges above a specific threshold so you don't need to wait forever until the, com the computer has uh, solved the result. And as theoretically predicted, the solution is exact. 
uh, now the, uh, a few simulations to illustrate what it looks like. This is a top view on a horizontal plane. This is the secondary source distribution. And it is driven such that it synthesizes a plane wave that moves downwards on the screen. And it, it, usually we use a, a plane wave to illustrate um, the results because it has very defined, very simple uh, properties. Plan our wave fronts and also uh, equal amplitude anywhere in space. So you can easily detect if something goes wrong. And now on the next slide I will present um, the view from the right onto the plane that is perpendicular on the screen. So you see that indeed this is, this is the horizontal plane, by the way, indeed, uh, in the entire volume, the sound field is properly synthesized. So, unfortunate, it is a bit unfortunate that only the result for the sphere is useful because many other... Uh, oh, sorry, I, I f completely forgot about that. Um, if, you, if you look at the classical literature on uh, ambisonics, you find that uh, I find a very simil similar formulation. Only in that case, it, you, they don't uh, assume a discrete distribution of secondary sources, but uh, a continuous distribution of secondary sources, but a discrete setup of loudspeakers. So instead of an integral, you have a summation here over the, the amount of uppercase J loudspeakers, which is then expanded into a spheric harmonics, and uh, the coefficients are compared. So if you compare this to the solution I have uh, proposed, you see that it's exactly the same. So the first result is that Ambisonics is a special case of the explicit single layer potential solution. More explicitly, it is a discrete formulation of the spherical uh, geometry. So the pity, uh, the pity about the, uh, this uh, uh, Fretholm theorem is that uh, we want to use also other geometries than the sphere. For example, a circular um, distribution. In this case, it is uh, uh, located in the horizontal uh, plane. Now we know, we see already that the prerequisites for the exact solution are not fulfilled, fulfilled because the secondary source distribution does not enclose the target volume. So we have to expect specific limitations. But uh, the way we found the solution in the, for the sphere is also helpful here. In this case, uh, the synthesis equation uh, represents a circular integral over the azimuth. And in that case, you can interpret it as a convolution along the surface of a sphere and relate the Fourier series expansion coefficients, which, is a, which are the coefficients of a different type of uh, an expa of orthogonal expansion of the sound field. And then again, you can solve it for the driving signal. And if there's no zero here, you can construct uh, this, reconstruct uh, the driving function. This is, these are the basis function in this case. Though you find out that you see it already here, there's the, the radius r in the equations. You have to f uh, reference the synthesis to the center of the setup. That means there's only, only in, the, in the center of the setup, there's one single point where, uh, in the general case, the sound field will be correct. As anywhere else, it is, uh, it is uh, different from the desired sound field. So this looks then, for example, for the plane wave like this. Again, it's a top view. On the horizontal plane, we have the secondary uh, source distribution uh, indicated by the black circle. And you see the plane wave exhibits plane wave fronts, or at least straight wave fronts in the horizontal plane but it also exhibits a specific amplitude decay, which is very characteristic for this type of synthesis, which is, which is termed, I go back, two and a half dimensional synthesis, because you have um, secondary sources with a, 3D, with a three dimensional transfer function, but you aim at synthesis in a plane, and since it's something be in between a two dimensional and a three dimensional problem, you, you term it two and a half dimensional problem. And again, if you look, uh, from the right-hand side onto the plane that is uh, perpendicular to the screen. It looks very different. This is, again, the secondary source distribution, the plane wave inside the horizontal plane. It uh, travels uh, to the left, but outside of the horizontal plane, of course, the sound field is very different from what we want to have. And another quick last example. This is um, for a linear secondary source uh, distribution situated along the x-axis. You can find uh, an, another convolution theorem which relates, relates the, the quantities in wave number domain. And again, you can solve this for the driving signal. And again, you have to reference it uh, to a line parallel to the secondary source distribution, which is then the only location where it's correct. Again, it's a two and a half dimensional synthesis. And the simulated sound fields look like this. This is the secondary source distribution. And again, we have this characteristic amplitude decay. And also we can look on the plane that is perpendicular 
to the screen, and you see again outside of the, uh, the horizontal plane, which is uh, indicated here, the sound field is different from what we want to have. So this is a uh, this is a summary of the geometries for which we found the solution. The sphere is the classical problem for which many authors, some of which are listed here, found uh, a solution. Which uh, they came from different directions, but in the end, of course, they, they found the same solution. And for the other geometries, we have proposed the solution. Excuse me. So that was the explicit solution of. Um, the synthesis equation, you can also find an implicit solution, and I will tell you in a minute what that is. If you, um, it, and this is actually provided by, uh, by uh, the approach of wave field synthesis, um, it, wave field synthesis basis, either you can uh, start with two different, from, start from two different directions. You can either start with the Rayleigh integral or with the kirchhoff helmholtz integral. I will um, quickly summarize uh, how it can be derived from the Kirchhoff-Helmholtz integral. The Kirchhoff-Helmholtz integral um, represents a physical law. It represents, it represents the fact that if you consider a volume, in this case uh, the, the, the yellow area, and it, it, which is source-free, and if you know the sound field and the uh, direction, the, the gradient uh, of the sound field perpendicular to the boundary, then you know exactly what sound field uh, is apparent inside the volume. On the other hand, you know that uh, you can reinterpret this and uh, state that if you can control the sound pressure and the gradient of the sound field on a boundary of a specific volume, you have full control over the sound field inside this volume inside this boundary. Um, you have to, in order to arrive at a practical solution, you have to apply a number of approximations, which then uh, yield a very uh, simple uh, uh, driving function, which can if be implemented very efficiently, which is then only uh, a high frequency approximation of the, uh, of the correct solution. But this is not a problem, as I will show in the following slides. Uh, sorry, one, uh, one slide in between. This is then a mathematical formulation. Actually, this is a little bit simplified, but it represents what I want to say. I want to say that we find the driving function without solving the entire equation from the physical relationships between the sound field on the boundary and the sound field in the volume. We can, calcu uh, we can calculate uh, the driving function. This, uh, I want to emphasize that this S and this S, this is the same. So if we know the sound field, we have to take some gradient and we have to do some selection of the secondary sources. We cannot use them all. We have to um, uh, se carefully select which one we use. We can, um, we can calculate the driving function without solving this equation. This is why we call it an implicit solution. And just uh, for illustration, the secondary source selection um, ref that you have, that is a consequence of one of the approximations you apply. Uh, um, describes the fact that you use only those secondary sources which are illuminated by the virtual sound field. So assume such a secondary source distribution and you want to synthesize a plane wave that travels to the right. You use only those secondary sources which are illuminated by the, by the uh, virtual sound field. And for the point source, this is similar. This is kind of intuitive, but actually if you... in, in uh, um, if you analyze the, the exact solution, you will find that uh, also the other uh, secondary sources uh, on, the, on, the, on the wrong side of the array, they also contribute, of course, in a very minor way, but uh, um, uh, physically they contribute to the synthesized sound field, although it travels into the other direction. Okay, now the, uh, the illustration of the accuracy. On the left-hand side, you see the exact solution and on the right hand side, the WFS uh, solution for a spherical secondary source distribution. This is, is the illuminated area, the secondary sources that are active, and those are those secondary sources which are inactive. And you see at very low frequencies, in this case, this is 200 hertz. For, uh, you see some minor deviations of the WFS solution compared to the exact solution. Uh, but this is, it's hard to prove, but this is most certainly inaudible. So, this sounds very much the same. And uh, if you go to higher frequencies, then yes? So could you provide 
back to the previous slide. So the difference between these two is because you're only using half of the points? Kind of. Um, and the approximation, uh, this is, uh, in, you have, you applied two approximations in this case. And one, um, the consequence of one is that you use only half of the secondary sources. If you would only use half of the secondary sources here, it would be, uh, this would become more similar to that one, but not exactly the same. Um, is that okay for the moment? So would there are two approximations, yeah. half of them, and there is something else, some other approximation. Exactly. And as I said, this is a high frequency approximation uh, that is applied in, in WFS. So if you go to higher frequencies, if the wavelength is significantly shorter, then the dimensions of the secondary source distribution, there's hardly any difference. So, and uh, I go back, as I said, it, this is probably, most probably not audible. So to summarize, um, the, for, uh, the, the uh, treatment of the continuous secondary source distributions, we have an explicit and an implicit solution. And the explicit solution is obviously found by explicitly, explicitly solving the equation and the implicit solution is uh, found without solving the equation by considering f some physical relationships. And the physical accuracy of the solution is, at least when it comes to sound field synthesis, it's equivalent. So far, so good. The problem is just that in practice, in theory, okay, we have such um, continuous distributions, but in practice, we have something like this, a discrete setup of a finite number of secondary sources. So in order to, to model, to mathematically grasp the impact of this spatial discretization, um, we do not assume a, a discrete secondary source distribution, but we assume a continuous distribution that is excited at discrete points. Because then, all the, the mathematical relationships we have established between the different quantities, they stay valid, and we just need to find a new driving function that equals the, uh, the continuous drive, driving function at the sampling points and vanishes elsewhere. This is exactly what we what is done in the analysis of, for example, the discretization of a time, of a continuous, a kind of time continuous uh, signal. And in order to emphasize the relationship to this uh, uh, time domain sampling, I want to quickly um, uh, review uh, the process. Uh, consider a continuous time domain uh, signal, S von T. In this case, it's purely real, so it might have um, a magnitude spectrum like this. Typically, it, 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 and some anti-aliasing filter is imposed in order to ensure that it's band limited. So in this case, it doesn't change much. If you then, uh, if you then discretize the signal in time with a specific constant interval, you will get repetitions in the spectrum of the signal. And in order to reconstruct the signal, you impose a low-pass filter in order to filter out the baseband of these repetitions. And the result is then, if everything uh, is, uh, goes, uh, if all parameters are selected accordingly, is then uh, the reconstructed signal is then equal to the initial continuous domain signal. And this is very similar in, uh, in, in, the, in spatial discretization. So here, in if we dis discretize a time domain signal, we get repetitions in time frequency domain. In spatial discretization, if we assume a constant sampling interval, we get repetitions in different representations of the space frequency, of, of the space spectrum. And um, which in which representation these um, repetitions arise depends on the, on the geometry of the secondary source distribution. So for the sphere, spherical distribution, we have repetitions in the coefficients of the spherical harmonics expansion. For the circle, we have the uh, repetitions um, in the Fourier series expansion coefficients and for the plane or the linear source we have repetitions in the k-space. So this should already ring a bell, this, uh, the, um, the, this list, if you remember for the sphere we found the solution in the spherical harmonics domain, here we found it in the Fourier series uh, coefficients domain and uh, the the solution for the lines, uh, the linear array we found in the wave number domain. So we have already calculated everything we need. We just need to analyze it a bit more. Now we'll use the example. So yeah, this is valid if you have loudspeakers placed closer to the 
half wavelength of the highest frequency? No, this is always the case. If you, um, uh, I will analyze the artifacts later in the talk, but if you have uh, placed the loudspeakers closer than half the wavelength, um, you, will, uh, the, uh, the, uh, you will hardly have any impact, or ha hardly have any difference between uh, a continuous distribution and this discrete distribution. But uh, these spectral repetitions, they always arise. It's just such that the spatial transfer function of the secondary sources, for example, if you assume a monopole or so, they, they suppress these repetitions, uh, these, uh, um, um, because when you have a, a small sampling interval, when the loudspeakers are close together, these repetitions are at very, very high space frequencies, and there they are suppressed by the spatial transfer function of the secondary sources, so you just don't realize that you have these repetitions there. Does it get... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Um, is there an assumption, or, or does it get messier if you have non-uniform spacing? Of it gets uh, significantly messier, because then you cannot identify these uh, repetitions. Something uh, uh, very intransparent happens then. So, uh, we, have, uh, we have not uh, analyzed it explicitly, but um, even, even uh, this analysis is quite complicated, so uh, if, if you, in the, this is the simplest cases that we analyzed, if you analyze uh, more advanced cases, it's really difficult to deduce any findings. So I want to illustrate uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, process of sampling and uh, the evolving repetitions on the example of the circular distribution. Remember, the driving function is a Fourier series, these are the basis functions the coefficients, and this is termed the order, m. Again, it doesn't need to, you don't need to sum from minus infinity to infinity because of the conversions of this series. So, the magnitude of the driving function might, may look like this. This is some triangular, it has some triangular shape. On the horizontal axis, you have the order m. In the center is zero, and this is the time frequency. Why it is such is not, uh, not uh, significant for the moment. So this is a continuous, this is the, uh, the, uh, what it looks like for a continuous uh, driving function. If you sample this driving function, these special repetitions arise. Excuse me, what, what is again the x-axis? This is, uh, I go back, uh, sorry. This is the order m, the index of the, f of the Fourier series, which you can interpret as some type of space frequency. So um, if you sample this continuous driving function, you get these rep repetitions, and since for unbounded frequency, uh, the, uh, this, uh, the, um, the spatial bandwidth of this uh, driving functions uh, is not limited, so the higher you go, the further you go to the sides, and the repetitions can overlap and interfere and cause what is termed spatial aliasing. And this is what we uh, pr uh, propose to term a spatially full band driving function, because, of course, I go back once more. You don't need to go uh, from a very high number to a very high number. You can uh, consciously uh, reduce the spatial bandwidth of the driving function just by uh, doing, uh, choosing narrow summation limits. And then the continuous driving function may, may, may lose, uh, look like this. We just decided here to sum only from minus 26 or minus 27 <coughs> to plus 27. Because if you then sample this driving function, the repetitions will not overlap and there will be no interference and the baseband will be uncorrupted. And this has, of course, significant impact on the synthesized sound field that I will illustrate in a minute. So, but uh, before that, I want to uh, state that if you analyze what happens in wave field synthesis, you realize that, that it's a spatially full band approach, the first one, uh, this one, this is what happens in wave field synthesis. And if you analyze ambisonics, then it's a, a, a narrowband approach, and this is, again, this case. So, we have, a we have one conclusion. That means, in general, WFS constitutes a high-frequency approximation, which is probably irrelevant, of near-field compensated infinite-order ambisonics. Usually, this is termed higher-order ambisonics, and this term higher-order um, refers to the fact that, I want to uh, go back again, you, you stop at a certain point. They just chose this terminology, although it's um, retrospectively it's not uh, very useful. 
So if you would go in Amazonics to infinite order, you would have approximately the same. But the fact that the WFS is especially uh, um, full band and Amazonics is narrow band has a very essential impact on the synthesized sound field. At low frequencies, you hardly see any difference. By the way, this, um, this example um, is equivalent to 27th order ambisonic, so you sum from minus 27 to plus 27. At a frequency of 1 kilohertz, you hardly see any difference. If you go to 2 kilohertz, you already see in the full band example, um, a huge portion of the, of the target area gets corrupted by artifacts, commonly referred to as spatial aliasing. In narrow band synthesis, something else happens. The, the sound field um, uh, gets smaller and, con and the energy concentrates around uh, the center of the array. If you go even higher in frequency, you see that at a certain point in WFS, the entire target area is filled uh, with uh, artifacts superposed on the desired sound field. And in the Amazonics example, the desired sound field gets very small and outside you have significant artifacts. Now, this is only half of the truth. Um, because um, you can interpret this, uh, this monochromatic uh, analysis as some kind of uh, frequent, yes? So when you, when you use 27 uh, in the uh, uh, space frequency domain, what, what, uh, what uh, unit is this? Um, it's no unit. Um, I go back again. 20, uh, the order of 27 means that we, we uh, choose the, the bounds of this summa summation as minus 27 and plus 27. Oh, so it's more the uh, size of your filter, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes and no. It's, uh, it, uh, it represents the spatial bandwidth. Uh, I go a bit forward again. So you could also go from, uh, you could uh, choose an order of 10, then you would make this even narrower. So if you then sample it, you would uh, have, n the repetitions themselves would be a bit narrower. But um, in a practical implementation, it means that uh, uh, want to go back again. Each mode is a filtering operation, and uh, you, at the end, you sum the filtered signals uh, uh, according to this uh, uh, um, formulation. So, if you reduce the order, you have to do less filtering and less summations, which is a bit more efficient, but uh, has essential impact uh, on the sound field. Does it answer your question? So, as I said, these monochromatic considerations. This is, ah, sorry, I forgot to uh, name that. It's uh, 56. It's the example that I showed uh, the, uh, in the panoramic image, uh, that one. This is the parameters are chosen exactly like in this uh, example on this image. So in this case, we looked at individual frequencies and, look, uh, and uh, investigated what happens uh, depending on the spatial bandwidth. But what is more uh, essential for the ear is the, temp the, the time domain structure of the sound field. And uh, we have also made some simulations. I'll start with the wave field synthesis. So you will now see the impulse, impulse response of the loudspeaker system when driven uh, in order to synthesize a plane wave. So that means we want to have a plane wave that moves downwards, and if you do that with a discrete array, sorry, it will look like this. So in the beginning there's not much to see, but then you realize that in the wave field synthesis case, you have indeed a very strong first wave front, and this is actually what we want, but afterwards you have a lot of um, different wave fronts, uh, the spatial aliasing, caused by spa which are spatial aliasing, uh, which move into various directions, and in the Amisonics example, it will look like this. So in, in, in the beginning, it all looks very different, but then you realize that there's something else goes on. In the center, we have this area where there's hardly any corruption, where we have indeed the desired impulsive wave front, but then we have some low frequency wave front around here, followed by high frequency wave fronts. So here, uh, there's a separation between the low and high frequencies taking place. I go back a bit on, on the slides, uh, um, uh, which is, you can also see this on, on this image. Here you have the desired uh, um, so, um, sound field superposed with artifacts, and here you have 
the, the, the synthesized sound field exhibits a specific curvature at high frequencies, which is not there if you go to lower fre frequencies. Like in this case, at low frequencies, we have straight wave fronts. And this is uh, also apparent in the time domain analysis. So, and this is perceptually a big difference. You have, we have here, we have the strong wave, uh, the first wave front. And here we have a separation of uh, low frequency and high frequency energy. So I see that uh, uh, it took me a bit longer than I uh, initially planned. So I will have to accelerate a bit. And I want to illustrate the, these, the essential psychoacoustical mechanisms on the example of two sound sources emitting sufficiently coherent signals. For example, two loudspeakers emitting uh, two signals. Yes? Okay. Is, there, is there any, I mean, if you had infinite number, if you had lots of speed, not is, is there any advantage to, to avoid some of the spatial listening to do kind of like, uh, in, you know, like a beamforming does this log linear array, we can sort of have different spacings to target different frequencies. Could you have like, if, if in theory you could have that kind of, can you, would that help? Yes, uh, it, uh, it, you could um, choose a different arrangement of the loudspeakers. Uh, like the, the log, uh, um, uh, um, spaced, uh, logarithmically spaced uh, microphone array. But then, and then you can reduce the spatial aliasing, but only for one specific uh, propagation direction of the plane wave. If you, if you want to synthesize a different propagation direction, then um, you would have uh, stronger artifacts than with the un uniform sampling. So, um, uh, let's maybe use this example. You could um, choose to put the loudspe loudspeakers closer together at the, at the point where the virtual plane waves uh, touches the secondary source distribution and choose a wider, wider spacing here. Then you could raise the aliasing frequency, the frequency where the artifacts arise. But this then would hold only if the, wave, the plane wave propagates downwards. If you want to synthesize a plane wave from that plane wave that propagates in that direction, you have more aliasing than in the, non, in the uniform sampling. So um, back to the, to the uh, psychoacoustical me mechanisms which might be relevant here. There's one mechanism which is termed summing localization, which happens, for example, when you listen to stereophony, you hear two loudspeakers. Uh, two loudspeakers are playing, but you hear only one sound source in the center. So the ear kind of combines um, the, the two signals and you hear some average. You don't hear the sound source left or right, you hear it in the center if the two loudspeakers are playing uh, coherent signals. And if, if you delay one loudspeaker by less than a millisecond, then the source moves uh, towards the, the other loudspeaker. Then if the time delay between the two wavefronts uh, is larger than, for example, a millisec uh, approximately a millisecond, then the president effect takes over. So you will hear the sound source exclusively in the earlier loudspeaker. Uh, so that only the, uh, the early loudspeaker determines localization and the, second, uh, the signal of the second loudspeaker will not consciously be perceived. It just adds a bit to the spatial uh, impression. And if you uh, have even stronger separation between uh, the two wavefronts in time, you can perceive an echo. So, and what happens here, I'll go back, is um, probably a mixture of everything. You have a strong wavefront followed by closely spaced wavefronts. The spacing is much closer than one uh, millisecond. So this could trigger summing localization. It might not, it's very difficult to say. And what happens here is very hard uh, to interpret it. We have made some many informal and also some formal uh, experiments which we have also published. We have measured tenth, tenths of thousands of impulse responses, of head-related impulse responses from the system we have in order to binaurally, to simulate the loudspeaker system over headphones uh, in order to have a controlled environment where you can seamlessly switch between uh, different uh, listening positions and different methods, um, uh, including head tracking and everything. You can download some samples from our spatial audio blog uh, which, in which, you, which contain the full binaural information so that you can get an idea of what it sounds like. It's very hard to, to summarize uh, our findings so far in two sentences, but uh, uh, the thing I want to emphasize is that it's very difficult to find out what happens because if you think you have found a, a basic mechanism in one situation, in a different situation it might be completely uh, different. So I think since the time has uh, progressed so much, I will skip... Uh, ah, sorry, I'm... 
Yeah. 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 Ah, sorry. Mm, I, I, I was always aiming at half past 11, so I can, I'm uh, sorry, I'm uh, a bit uh, uh, confused. So I can, I can take it easy, very good. So I can summarize on the discreti discretization artifacts. We saw that at low frequencies, they all, they, even the discrete secondary source distributions, they all perform comparably. Um, um, what the big difference is in the, in the performance at the high frequencies, and what properties uh, arise in the synthetic sound field depends essentially on the spatial bandwidth of the driving function. And I have put my PhD thesis here as a reference because I see this as the most significant result of my work so far. Um, and by the way, these, this, spatial, uh, this spectral repetition thing and all these findings hold also for numerical approaches. Um, because it's, again, it's still a, disc a discrete array of loudspeakers and uh, the, the, uh, the repetitions in the, spectrum of the, in the spatial spectrum of the driving function, they arise anyway, no matter if you, if you have found the solution numerically or not, or if you have used an explicit solution or an implicit solution. It, um, it, the, the repetitions are always there. So, and I also show that a manipulation of the spatial bandwidth can change the properties of the artifacts. I go back again to remind you. For here you can have artifacts that superimpose the desired sound field and here you can separate the artifacts and the desired sound field. And there's more possibilities. You could, and, and we have uh, proposed uh, a number of methods that um, we decided to term local sound field synthesis because you can, so I go back again, you can move uh, this spot where the synthesized sound field is accurately uh, synthesized to different locations. And since this uh, represents a local increase of uh, the accuracy, of course by the cost of uh, more significant artifacts elsewhere, we decided to term it local sound field synthesis. So that was, uh, uh, I think, enough for the moment for um, the uh, analysis of the basic properties. We can move on to some application examples. The, the plane wave example I showed was, is, of course, not very... Uh, uh, impressive in uh, practice uh, because um, it, uh, it's a very simple sound field. You can do much more. You can, for example, have focused sources. I can show you quickly what a focused source is. This is a focused source. We have a secondary source distribution down here. This is a linear one in that case. And it synthesizes a sound field that converges towards a focus point. This is uh, where the sound field focuses, and this is the area where it converges. It passes the focus point and diverges again. And in this part of the target plane, it looks very similar to the sound field of a monopole sound source that is located here. So if a listener is positioned here, he will hear a sound source in front of the loudspeakers. And this is, it, it actually works in practice. It, ha it exhibits some um, essential uh, uh, limitations, but still, it, it can work, and this is a very um, essential property of sound field synthesis because if you think about large venues like, uh, like a cinema, and um, in stereophony the problem is that you cannot create auditory events that are closer than loudspeakers. So if you want to, for example, synthesize a soundscape, replay a soundscape over, uh, like rain uh, over a stereophony, you always, it sounds like you're, you're sitting in a, in, a, in a dry bubble and the rain is happening somewhere in the distance or around you, even if it's a surround system. But you can use, for example, these uh, focused sources in order to place individual raindrops uh, in the audience. And this, uh, this essentially in, increases the, the immersion because you, can, you really feel like being inside this scene. So one one approach uh, to, um, to synthesize... There was a question here from the audience. Can you simulate the sunshine? So we, we have enough rain what, here. What's yeah. wrong with the dry bubble? That's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I cannot. No. <laughs> not, not acoustically. <laughs> uh, So one way uh, to, uh, to find the, uh, uh, the driving function for the focus sources is to start with a point source 
you, uh, a purely diverging sound field indicated by the arrows, and then reverse the timing of the loudspeakers. In this case, the loudspeakers in the center place first, and then um, gradually towards the sides, the loudspeaker, um, uh, the other loudspeakers play. If you now make the loudspeakers on the far ends play first, and the loudspeaker in the center play at last, you will indeed get this sound field that diverges towards this focus point, and then uh, that converges to the focus point and then diverges again uh, and makes up uh, a focus source. You can, we, ha we have proposed a number of, of different uh, formulations of this, by, uh, which based on the manipulation of the desired sound field in a specific transformed domain, like a plane wave decomposition. You, you, you decompose the sound field of a monopole into plane waves and then re recompose it only by taking part of the, uh, in, uh, 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 one section of plane waves, those which propagate into the target area, and the result is then a focused source. I will not go into details because... Um, yes. yes? So if we're trying to reconcile these nice pictures with the other the ones that, that had... All, oh, no, the ones that had all the aliasing in it. So if you wanted to synthesize a broadband source yeah. in front of you, would you have this kind of artifacts? at that point? No, um, I have to move to, my, to the backup slides in order to uh, show you one second. I have prepared that. It, it, uh, focus sources have very specific properties in terms of um, the aliasing artifacts. Oh. Uh, mm. Now if I do this. Oh, sorry. This is down here. So this is, this is again, a linear array. Um, the, so the secondary sources are marked by black crosses, which you can probably not see, but they are around uh, there, with a spacing of 20 centimeters. Synthesizing a focus source one meter in front of the array. For a low frequency of one kilohertz, it all looks fine. If you move on to higher frequencies, you see that around the focus source, Always, in any case, no matter if it's, uh, if it's spatially broad, uh, wide band or, or narrow band, always uh, a region arises where there, there is no artifacts. The artifacts are elsewhere, and this region gets smaller if you go higher in frequency. So this is very different, and this, is, this is, can, be very can, can be beneficial if you're located here, but it can be problematic if you're uh, located there, because in, in, in the case of focused sources, it is such that... Um, it's not, it's not such that the, uh, the, the, f the desired wavefront is followed by the artifacts, but the artifacts occur before the desired wavefront, and this triggers, uh, obviously triggers uh, very different uh, perceptual mechanisms. In your simulations, you use a single point uh, uh, sound sources. Does using loudspeaker actually change any of the... Uh, would that change the uh, simulation significantly? Uh, not in terms of the aliasing, no. If you, a real loudspeaker ha has a specific, uh, more complex directivity towards higher frequencies, that, um, that has some impact on the, desired, uh, on, on the, on the sound field that's synthesized, but it's not very essential. It, uh, it changes the amplitude uh, distribution a little bit, but there's no essential um, impact on the, on the uh, structure of the wavefronts, which, uh, which is the more important. So it's counterintuitive because it seems like given that the loudspeaker is somewhat of a plane uh, moving rather than a single point, it would affect the uh, space frequency domain quite a bit. You, know? you mean if, if the loudspeaker has a considerable spatial extent? Well, I mean point, point 0.2 meters. That is the, I, I don't, the spacing I, I, between the, two, the loudspeaker. Right, right. Are, I, I would think right. that this, the size of the, the plane that the loudspeaker is driving is not considerably smaller than uh, 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 20 At low frequencies, it's not. I go back to uh, to the uh, to the photograph. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, um, so these loudspeakers, the spacing is about 17 centimeters. So we uh, the loudspeakers we chose are significantly smaller, but um, they are two-way loudspeakers. We, you have some mid-range driver and a high-frequency driver and. When the large loudspeaker is active, this is at a rather low frequency range where there's hardly any artifacts anyway. And at the high frequency range where the considerable artifacts arise, 
uh, we have the very small loudspeaker uh, which is active, so it won't change much. Closer to a point source down to a surface. Yeah, it's hard to hard to say where there is uh, uh, in the transition between the two, but it is very. The problem is that at high frequencies, it is very difficult to measure the directivity of a loudspeaker uh, with a high spatial resolution. So it's hard to say what happens. So that was the focus source, um, and of course it, you don't need to um, synthesize, uh, assume an omnidirectional point source or focus source. You can also describe sources with complex directivities. An example is this one. The following: uh, you can. The problem is in, in that if in wave field synthesis you have this strong first wave font that I showed you, which on the one hand. Um, um, causes very um, uh, accurate localization. This is often praised in scientific papers. That's fine, but in some cases it can be uh, a problem because uh, uh, the locatedness of a sound source is very large. That means the amount to which the energy is focused or to a point is, is very high, so you hear a very small source. If you have a sparse scene, Imagine a venue like this room, equipped with an according loudspeaker system. You have sound sources, it's three or four sound sources. You have a lot of space in between the sound sources where there's nothing. So you would want to um, control the perceived extent, the spatial, the apparent source width of, of the sound sources. One, some approaches that have been um, proposed in the context of uh, stereophony and such methods, they split a given sound source, sound source into several sources which are put at s different locations and those individual sources are then driven with decorrelated signals. It can sound extremely good. Um, I heard um, a demonstration by Wille Pulki at the uh, last year's spatial audio, uh, AES Spatial Audio Conference in Tokyo and it was really, really uh, impressive. The only problem is that you cannot control the for example, the orientation of a sound source. So there is some room for improvement. So we have recently proposed to model a virtual sound source, um, to model a, so a virtual sound source that uh, vibrates in higher spatial modes. Like, for example, the string of a guitar, it doesn't only vibrate in the very low mode, like this, but there's some um, partial, uh, um, there are some harmonic modes, and you can do this also, assume this with spatial vibration. Uh, so it, 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 uh, then a very complex sound field evolves, which lowers the coherence between the signals at two ears, at the ears of the listener, and then this can increase the perceived extent. I have some example, which um, uh, it will be a two-channel uh, um, audio signal, which the channels contain the sound fields of the, the, the signals captured by, by, a virtual, uh, by two virtual omnidirectional microphones put in the sound field at these positions, approximately at the distance of the ears. It is not, you will not, it will not sound exactly like you would hear, you would, would he, like what you would hear, but you at least get an idea of what it could sound like. So first the input signal. Es tut mir wirklich leid, dass ich am Wochenende nicht zum Essen kommen konnte. Kurz bevor ich losfahren wollte, hatte ich einen kleinen Unfall. So Von hier aus gibt es zu meinem Haus auch eine Abkürzung. If you're über sitting uh, in the center, you should hear a sound source in between the two loudspeakers, yeah. which is <laughs> which is rather small. <laughs> so maybe maybe you want to move here, yeah, and the best is of course always to close your eyes. So I, I'll play again. Es the tut mir wirklich signal. leid, dass ich am Wochenende nicht zum Essen kommen konnte. Kurz and then a simulated source of uh, of half a meter of size. Uh, of length, uh, a plane, uh, a, pla a plate of uh, this size. Es tut mir wirklich leid, dass ich am Wochenende nicht zum Essen kommen konnte. Kurz bevor ich losfahren wollte, hatte ich einen kleinen Unfall. Von es tut mir wirklich leid, dass ich am Wochenende nicht zum Essen kommen konnte. Kurz bevor ich losfahren wollte, hatte ich the room, but uh, also if you listen over headphones, you see that the sound gets indeed broader. Maybe here the, you, you don't look so convinced, so maybe uh, uh, the loudspeakers are too high or too, too far apart. And uh, also there are many uh, parameters that you, you can tune in this example, uh, and this is uh, the, the parameters we chose uh, are certainly far away from being optimal. 
I have another, uh, one last example. You can, you, in many cases, you will of course have, want to have a sound source that, uh, that moves. Um, if you, in, in real life, a moving sound source exhibits uh, the Doppler effect, that means that is a consequence of the fact that the speed of sound in air is constant, irrespective of uh, the motion uh, of, of a source. So a sound source that uh, moves towards you, uh, raises, if, if the sound source, is, source moves towards you, the pitch is raised, and if it, uh, if it moves away from you, the pitch is uh, lowered. In many applications, you will not want that, because uh, if you think, for example, about a telephone, uh, te teleconferencing scenario, and you have people, talk, people talking and you move them uh, with some multi-touch or, uh, or other interface. And if you mo pull the persons closer, the, the voice will uh, rise. And if you put them, push them away, the, uh, the pitch will go down. So this sounds very irritating. So you would want to suppress this Doppler effect. What you can do is to uh, synthesize a sequence of stationary po positions and crossfade between the sequence. And this, uh, depending on the, how you choose the parameters, this on, on one hand it can suppress the Doppler effect, but on the other hand, if you uh, use very short intervals uh, of the sequence, this can also create a frequency shift. We have then provided, uh, proposed to derive the driving signal from a model of the sound field of a moving source in order to synthesize the Doppler effect. And this indeed works. Uh, I have uh, an, oh, sorry, an animation of that. So this would be the moving source. And it moves quite, quite quickly. This is, of course, um, uh, slow motion. And you see, obviously, how these sound waves are compressed in direction of motion and how they are expanded in the other direction. Mm -hmm. And if you drive a, loud, uh, a loudspeaker system accordingly. Then it will look like this. In the, the, sound, uh, the source moves along, uh, along here, approximately. So in direction of motion, the sound waves are compressed and in the opposite direction, they are expanded. And you can do much more. Uh, I think these are enough examples for the moment. So I want to, uh, before I conclude, I want to uh, mention uh, the, the software we wrote. Uh, it's, we termed it Soundscape Renderer. We had to find a name for it. It, uh, it implements the, most ba uh, the basic versions of uh, uh, most of the spatial audio rendering algorithms. Wave hypnosis, vector based amplitude panning, ambisonics amplitude panning, and many binaural uh, versions of the binaural um, rendering. Um, this is an example with a loudspeaker system. Uh, these symbols represent the 56 channel loudspeaker system, and then they have a lot of sound sources. <coughs> and if you listen, you use a binaural method, the loudspeaker system is replaced by yourself. And uh, there's an interface for head tracking and everything. You can download the source code. The software only has one flaw. I, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> That's two flaws. Uh, I'm sorry. It was not my decision. So I finally conclude. The the physical fundamentals of sound field synthesis can elegantly be, be elegantly be described using integral equations. Then. We have identified ambisonics and wave synthesis as two special uh, cases of the solution. The spatial bandwidth is essential in terms of the properties of the synthesized sound field. Uh, remember the, 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 structure, the different structures of the wavefronts. Then I show that various types of virtual sources are possible, moving sources, sources with directivity, focused sources and the like. The only problem is that perception of synthetic, synthetic sound fields is hardly known. Now, uh, I want to, uh, I have one last slide with an outlook. I will start with a white uh, uh, slide in order to increase the excitement. <laughs> I, I have been one of the very few, fortunate, uh, very few fortunate persons in this world who have access to, to all the different types of, of uh, uh, audio reproduction systems. We, I have access to this uh, uh, 800 channel lo uh, wave frequency systems, a system we have, uh, this, uh, the five, 20, uh, 56 channel system in our laboratory. We have a, a heap of individual loudspeakers that we can arrange in various ways. I have traveled to many laboratories in order to hear the system. And I think uh, it is indeed such that sound field synthesis can be superior to other audio presentation methods, especially for large venues 
or especially if you have um, a clear reference of what something sh should sound like. If you listen to, uh, to a pop music recording, it won't tell you much because there's no, real, uh, no acoustic, no unamplified pop music. So the sound of pop music is very closely related to the sound of stereophony. But if you listen to classical music replayed uh, over stereophony or, the, or, or traditional ambisonics or any other uh, loudspeaker um, arrangement with a low number of loudspeakers, it sounds different uh, to, the, to, to real classical music in the sense that um, it doesn't contain as many details, both spatially and also with respect to, with respect to the timbre. So some information is, is getting lost. This can be better if you use sound field synthesis because you have more, uh, more uh, degrees of freedom, you can add more details. Still, it doesn't sound perfect, but it can be uh, superior. Not always. There are also situations where stereophony and other um, methods are superior. But certainly, in, the, in the, its current state, sound field synthesis is not the ultimate solution. There is, it, it's just not uh, uh, reasonable to employ dozens or maybe hundreds of loudspeakers for this uh, potential benefit. On the other hand, other audio presentation methods can most likely not overcome their limitations. For example, in stereophony, you will always have a sweet spot, especially if you, if you serve multiple people. There's, it's, uh, there's no way to overcome this. So neither nor is the solution. Probably we will experience a convergence between the methods um, there's a small company called Iozono in uh, Eastern Germany which commercially um, sell wave field synthesis systems. They have also equipped, uh, for example, Man's Chinese Theatre in, in Hollywood with a system. And they have a new generation of their systems where they significantly reduced the number of loudspeakers. Um, so they have a, initially they had a loudspeaker spacing of maybe 15 centimeters or so, and now they use half a meter to a meter. So this significantly reduces the amount of loudspeakers. This new generation of systems, it, I had it twice, once in the laboratory where it sounded really great. Then I heard it on a Tonmeister Tagung, which, uh, which is a, a German uh, meeting of uh, tone masters of balance engineers. So it was a different room, though the same system. I was not really convinced, but still, uh, this is uh, certainly uh, an important step into the right direction. And also, does this convergence of method, methods could be uh, something like a desktop audio system where you, have, uh, where you put a number of small loudspeakers onto the screen and then you, you form beams that control the, uh, the sound pressure at the ears of the listener. Or uh, as uh, some uh, of you in the, uh, the, uh, in the speech technology group, you have, I um, heard that you have this uh, linear array where you do some uh, a quiet zone uh, um, synthesis and such. So it's not clear where to go, but uh, it's certainly such that the solutions that are around are not, uh, there's not the ultimate solution and, uh, amongst them. And of course, whatever you do, since we cannot achieve ultimate physical accuracy, we have to consider how the ears work uh, and then optimize uh, the methods accordingly. Usually I end such long talks with an image uh, that summarizes and represents the contents, but I think in this case I leave this slide uh, because uh, it's uh, certainly uh, an inspiring uh, and good inspiration for, for the discussion. Thank you very much. So is there, I mean, if you went to, I guess one of the questions is, you, I mean, you mentioned, so if, you know, there's these commercial, now it's like Yamaha, there's, there's these commercial linear arrays that are so, is, can the sound fields of this stuff, uh, I mean, and what I know about this stuff is, is, is it sort of seems to be presented much more from like the beamform and classic case rather than the, all the physics from the theory behind the sound field synthesis, but is it, can you take the sound field synthesis framework is sort of in a linear array, it also applies and you would get that kind of solution or is it a good, like, different animal? No, uh, it's closely related. Um, Beamforming some kind of optimized plane wave uh, synthesis. So uh, also if you uh, use a, an array of loudspeakers uh, uh, um, uh, for beamforming, you will have something, uh, no, what was that? Yeah, we, uh, we will have 
something like this. The individual loudspeaker, the timing uh, of the individual loudspeakers causes individual wave fronts, which of course it will not be exactly like this or like that, but uh, you will have a specific complex structure of wave fronts. So, um, and it's, it's a sampled array. You can, you could, sorry, you could uh, probably, uh, um, or you can uh, on the, at first stage assume a continuous array and then form the beams and then analyze how it, uh, how, how the discretization affects it, so there's is a very close relationship. So it's interesting mathematically to go and think of a planar wave uh, just to see the impact. But in practice, is this even desirable, or what are the kind of things that you like to generate? Plane waves can be um, uh, useful. Um, for example, in the creation of reverberation, um, because uh, Certainly, you don't need to, to accurately measure um, the reverberation of a room in order to, to, to mimic it with a loudspeaker system, but you can, you can uh, use a, a set of plane waves, Im waves impinging from different directions, um, which uh, contain decorrelated signal, and this can make a pretty good spatial impression. So this could be useful. Then what you often do is, uh, for efficiency, uh, you synthesize point sources, because they have a specific uh, fixed location. Um, this is, can be if, uh, implemented very efficiently, so you can have an, uh, a high number of sources. It sounds a bit boring. Imagine you synthesize uh, a person speaking with a, an omnidirectional source, and no matter where you move in the target zone, you will always have, always have the impression that the person talks towards you. It increases uh, the, the spa uh, it uh, enhances the spatial impression if you. Uh, impose a specific directivity on the sound source, which you can also do. It is then less efficient to implement. You can then not have dozens of sources, but maybe 10 sources or so on one computer in real time. But uh, then you will hear the orientation of this person that is talking to you, which can be uh, uh, beneficial in aesthetic terms. I guess what I was referring to is it depends on the application. In some applications, if you want to do uh, teleconferencing or telepresence, I would expect to reproduce you as a point source, not as a plane wave. So I'm not particularly interested in uh, how well this system will work for a plane wave. I'm interested in how well I can pretend that there is a point source that is you located there and then another one that is even located there and can I perceive that? So that may be more interesting than a plane wave. Kind of like what you showed uh, later, the point yeah. sources. Uh, I agree. Um, the reason why we uh, choose the plane wave uh, for the analysis of the basic properties is that, first of all, you can decompose any sound field into a set of, in a, to a continuum of plane waves. So you can uh, uh, um, uh, make, uh, uh, can deduce information. On the other hand, uh, because of its simple geometrical structure, because as I showed in two and a half dimensional synthesis, um, here, if you, if you would analyze this, uh, the, the synthesized sound field by the circular array uh, by means of a point source, you would have a different curvature of the wavefronts, but you, the, the sound field of the point source e exhibits some inherent amplitude decay. And then this two and a half dimensional, this incorrect two and a half dimensional amplitude decay is imposed on this already existing amplitude decay. And you, it can happen that you just don't see it from a visual inspection. So in, in the, in the, with the plane wave, we know that, I go back again to the spherical array. We know that this is what we want. We want plane wave fronts and constant amplitude everywhere. Um, for the, if you synthesize the sound field of a, of a point source, you have the amplitude decay. So here, we see that there is not constant amplitude uh, everywhere. So this is some basic property of this, uh, of this loudspeaker array which can happen that you don't see it if you use a com more complex sound field. Is that uh, what you... Uh, yeah, I mean, I was saying that I cannot imagine many uh, real applications where that is... I mean, there are some where that's the desired outcome. Of course, of, of course. the scenario. So maybe not as important as what, has the, what are the scenarios that I want to accurately reproduce yeah. and how well do I do there? Yeah. So yeah, um, so they are. It's mathematically maybe convenient, but maybe 
In practice, there are two, scenari two essential different scenarios. One is where you record a scene with a microphone or microphone array that captures the spatial information, like a spherical array, and you want to resynthesize or recreate this sound field using by means of a loudspeaker array. This is one scenario, so you don't manipulate or you don't impose spatial information onto uh, uh, the signals, you just want to recreate them. The other scenario is where you record the sound sources individually, like people uh, sitting at the table, everybody has his, individual, his or her individual microphone. Then you have uh, the individual audio signals in, in individual channels, so you can arrange them in space uh, as you would like to reproduce the people as point sources or uh, or uh, other complex sources or moving sources or so. So these are the two different scenarios. I have a question about returning back to the reducing the order of the filters. So you have a 56 loudspeakers in a circle of one and a half meters. So that's exactly 1016 hertz is yours like with uh, frequency. So below 1016 hertz, everything is nice and cold. And then you go up and you reduce the order, and you still have kind of able to overcome the Shannon, the spe special version of the, Sh of the Shannon theorem. And we know that this is not possible, so you lose something. What is this? If you do this order limitation, um, you reduce, uh, y you concentrate the energy of your uh, synthesized, or of your desired sound field into a, to a specific region. Those um, orders uh, around, uh, close to zero, those uh, low lower orders, they describe the sound field around um, the center of the expansion. In, that ca in this case, it is the center of the array. So the, the low orders, they describe the sound field around here. So, um, and this, the spatial extent of the sound field is, he, uh, is strongly dependent on the frequency. So, say, a fifth order sound field at one hertz has, an, uh, at, at 100 hertz, has an extent of several meters, but at one kilohertz, a fifth order sound field has an extent of maybe this uh, size. So, here, you, at low frequencies, you do not realize that this is order limited. If you go to higher frequencies, you realize the order limitation because this is your uh, desired sound, sound field. This is an order-limited uh, order plane wave. The energy is concentrated around the center, and you, just ha hard, you have hardly any information around here. This is what you lose. If you go higher in frequency, the concentration around the center is even stronger. So this is your desired, desired sound field, the desired plane wave. And th these are uh, the, inv uh, the individual repetitions of the um, uh, of the drying function, I go back. Uh, uh, yeah, I go back. So this is this is it describes the sound field around the center, and these higher orders, these in this case uh, where the repetitions are, describes the sound field at locations far from the center. So that's your special. Oh yes. Do we have the same resolution of rotating the direction? Yeah. So the only thing you lose is that you shrink pretty much the the, the listening zone. Yeah, yeah, the zone where you uh, where the sound where the synthesized sound field is accurate. This is what you shrink. Yeah. Uh, the problem is that um, um, if you could, uh, or if if you assume a, um, a continuous secondary source distribution, synthesizing order limited sound field, you will only have that thing in the middle, this uh, this uh, channel, and anywhere else you will ha have a very low amplitude. 20, 30, 40 dB lower than the desired sound field. So, in, uh, so if you would, uh, uh, the listener would be located in the center, you would hear the signal, and if you go one step to the side, the signal would pass away. Or actually, the higher frequencies are reduced, and then the further you go away, the lower uh, are the frequencies that are remaining. So, and if we have a discrete array, we have these artifacts which kind of add energy uh, to where the desired sound field does not have energy. So it might even sound better to have these artifacts than to ha uh, non not having them. Thank you. More questions? Thank you, Els. Thank you again. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>